This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. We are joined by all the usual suspects. I am Russ. And I'm Kyle. And how's it going? How's it going, guys? Brad, how are you doing this week, sir? Well, this week, hmm, I'll be honest, <laughs> I'm kind of bummed over the weekend because uh, the state of our country and Independence Day, but I'm, yeah. recover- I'm recovering. But yeah, I'm yeah. good tonight. Thanks. Did you shoot off any fireworks? Nope. Make any explosions? No fires? Wow. You didn't blow anything up? <laughs> I thought I about blowing some things up. <laughs> more trouble that I'm ready to get into. Just <laughs> Mike, how you Remember doing? on this 4th of July when we celebrate our independence that liberals have guns too. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <Yeah>. Careful. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> Randall, how you doing, sir? How's your back? Oh, my back's doing well. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, since that episode a few weeks ago where I threw it out, lifting a microwave, um, you know, I guess that's too many years of laying cement block and carrying railroad ties on my shoulder and yeah. climbing up 25 foot ladders with 90 pound roll roofing on my shoulder. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I gotta yeah. be a little careful, but, uh, I am going to try this stuff that's that, that, uh, Mike how has given me that, um, we're going to give it a shot, you know, another brand of CBD oil and salve. Uh-huh. I mean, there's so many cool products out there now to try. So I'm going to try this one, um, see how it works. I'm going to do both the internal and the external and see if it, uh, you know, helps the stiffness in my lower back, which actually yeah. is doing pretty good right now. Um, and I so I'm, I'm going to report to you guys on how, how, how the stuff works, but it's, I like it because they used my likeness in the packaging. So, ah, you know, there you um, go. let's see. Yeah. Um, Got a picture it, of Zeus on there. Catastrophic yeah, healing. <laughs> yeah. Um, is this it? You're like, yeah, this. yeah. You can see. Yeah. <laughs> right. Here you can see. <laughs> but it, it was, ta- it's from an older photograph. So, you know, <laughs> before my hair, before my hair went gray, but, um, yeah, I'm going to get nice I, butt flap. I'm going to get, get my, uh, <laughs> No, but the stuff I, I've been using, I mean, the stuff I used before, I think it was helping, but it, it, the taste of it, whereas the taste of this is actually kind of kind of good. I mean, it's like chocolate or something. Um, oh, yeah. Anyways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it, and, and if it works, if I like it, I'll endorse it. If it doesn't do anything, I'm not going to endorse it. Um, you know, I suppose at some point, what, we're going to be doing ads if we are trying to raise revenue for our grandiose projects and things that are on the drawing board right now that we're going to be sharing with people. But, um, yeah, but if that day comes, which I, I kind of hope it does, cause it means we've got a, a lot of people listening, but if it does, I mean, I, and I'm sure you guys feel the same way. There's no endorsements of anything that, that I, or we have not personally tried or like, or use. I mean, if it's something I like, if I use it, whatever, I, I'll endorse it. But if I'm not, otherwise I'm, I don't think I'm going to, but. Um, right. Yeah. That makes sense. It'd be, it'd be good yeah. to know the products you're endorsing for sure. Yeah. I think that's an important part of maintaining our integrity and our, 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 um, you know, yeah. Our academic integrity, if you will. So last week we were, we were looking at the, um, we were going through the Tunguska survivor accounts. We were, we're going to keep, we're going to keep going stuff, through those. Isn't it? Yes. They were amazing accounts. Oh Yeah. And, 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 you know, I've thought many times about what it would take to then not be able to speak for years. Right. Yeah. You know, that's really, really stunning what, what people might have, must have witnessed. Right. Well, a lot of them really did believe that, that this was it. This was, it was the end of the world that they were now, that's what was happening real time. The end of the world, um, which is something you find 
repeated fairly frequently when you start studying into some of the great disaster phenomena in human history, especially some of the cosmic type stuff like we're talking about here. And there's more. There's a lot more of it. And we are definitely going to be delving into some of that because I think the lessons to be extracted from there are, are critically important. And, and it can help us make sense out of a lot of traditions that have come down to us through various venues that otherwise maybe just sound like some kind of superstitious, um, you know, nonsense or something. But then when you realize that, no, this may be attempts on the part of people to describe things within their particular framework of understanding. And if they don't have the vocabulary, they don't have the conceptual framework to make sense out of what they're experiencing. Yeah. They'll use whatever kind of metaphors that they can draw from their personal experience. Right. And a lot of times those metaphors are also, um, cultural. Yes. Right. Or something that, that we would have no concept today of. Right. And so right. it com becomes a problem of translation over time then. Right. I can say like last week, what was really striking me was I remember reading quite, quite a few of these accounts uh, a long time, years ago. And they sounded very strange. I had a hard time understanding some of the references, I mean, yeah, you, you can kind of get the the idea of, you know, the sky splits open or mm -hmm. it appears to come from the sun or there's a spear or there's a sword. But some of the noise descriptions were odd to me. And But when you were going through them again last week, what was interesting is now I'm recalling all the videos I watched of the Chelyabinsk thing. So the, I had a greater understanding of the of the sounds because of that those videos – you know, there's multiple mentions in the accounts you said where there's there's an initial gigantic, well, there's all the light displays, and there's this enormous mm -hmm. noise or freight train sounds, and then there's these continuing percussion noises, explosions and booms. And that was apparent in the Chelyabinsk one. If you watch that, mm -hmm. a lot of the videos, there's a really loud sound, and then after that, it sounds like artillery going off mm -hmm. that fades away into the distance, you know, multiple boom sounds. And so that that part made a lot more sense to me this time around because of Mm -hmm. I had the sure. I had better context from from watching the videos of that thing. The so. thing that I have found the most interesting in reading these accounts, I think, well, all of it's interesting, but this idea that people felt like it was also something happening beneath subterranean, something happening yes. below their feet, that it right. was something happening in the earth itself. You know that they that this thing explodes in the atmosphere, but it creates enough of a shock in the actual ground that emanates outwards that people feel that, you know, as part of this whole phenomena. So, you know, it's, it's atmospheric, of course, and it's audio, it's visual, but it's also very tactile because it's this sense of something like in one of the descriptions, it was like multiple freight trains passing, you know, beneath their feet in the ground. And, um, that would, yeah, that would make it seem pretty, pretty incredible. The kind of uh, a thing that you would remember for the rest of your life. Um, yeah. Did you and know something... they found a big chunk of that Chelyabinsk meteor? I hadn't heard that before, but I was actually looking at some of uh, the Joe Rogan interviews with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, yeah, they, uh, yeah, they, they found a lot of pieces. They had, uh, uh, you know. A chunk, I'm going to say it was a big watermelon again. It was about the size of the one out in the <laughs> meteor crater. You know, it, it was that big, but it was, yeah, it was over a thousand pounds, they said. I didn't know they had found uh, uh, any any large chunks like that from it. Yeah, I remember the reports of them going out into the mountains looking for pieces. And uh, I remember they were saying they were finding pieces, but I didn't know they found one that big. That's that's interesting. Yeah. And it was in a lake, so they had dredged to ah. pull it out of a lake, yeah. And then the, the 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 accounts where people felt like big stones were falling from the sky and hitting the earth. Yeah. Right? Again, the sense that there's a, there's a tactile component to this thing, you know. Um, and then some of the sound, speaking of sounds, you know, like, it was like I heard the sound as of a great wind. Or I heard the sound as the fluttering of birds. Now, that's interesting to me. Um, yeah, that one is, that is a strange. Oh, and they showed that in that preview for the movie we, we just watched too. 
they were hearing something and they, they ran outside and it was a bunch of birds taking off. Yeah, all the, all the birds take off. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, they'd feel they'd feel the shock waves coming. Yep. yep. The, the pre, I guess, some sort of pre wave. Well, it's like a lightning strike too, though. You can feel the the static in the earth around you, and then you know if you get hit by one nearby. I've I've been real close to three or four, and uh, yeah, you, you feel it. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It, it's Why that, am I not surprised to know that? I know. I'm just like, well, yeah, that's just classic. Actually, rad. when he first when he lost his hair. <laughs> if you recall, that was now it comes one up. of the lightning strikes, wasn't that it? Um, <laughs> the first three no. turned it white. <laughs> the last one removed it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I was gonna say that it the used to uh, be all straight out there between the first <laughs> one and the second one. I was like, I'm gonna do something about this. Yeah. So I stood out. Oh, yeah, show the storm. Them. Yeah, next next episode, show them the pictures when you had that afro. <laughs> if you were that was my bullwinkle look. <laughs> um, what you well, looking for yeah. there, Randall? Oh, I just cool stuff that read I read them wanted. to us. Don't read them to yourself. Let's hear what? It. <laughs> I think we I'll, while you guys are doing that, I want to look up this some of these videos from Chelyabinsk. Maybe we can play some of this for the for the noises. I think it's really important. For anybody who hasn't seen mm-hmm. them, we can might okay. be. Yeah, what I think would were, were some of the videos where they show inside buildings where the, the shock effect could like broke through doors and windows and knock people on the ground inside buildings. And then, of it, course, it, it, it was a major blast. Yeah. The repeated references to tongues of fire, pillars of fire. Yeah. I mean, how can you not make a biblical association there? Right. And then, you know, uh, like this one, one had the impression, speaking in terms of the, the subterranean component of it, one had the impression that the earth was just about to gape open and everything would be swallowed up in the abyss. Yeah, fearful bangs resounded from somewhere, shaking the earth, and the invisibility of the source inspired a kind of superstitious terror. People were literally dumbfounded. So, yeah, we did read that last week, but it's it's worth, you know, processing again because. Um, yeah, that's the thing. Depending on your location, if you didn't see any right light in the sky, you know, that you would have start probably started feeling the ground shake before you heard a sound unless unless uh, the shockwave from the sound passed you first, because it would be moving faster than the speed of sound. But I would the, think that the pa- that the shockwave through the ground is moving faster well, than... Well, yeah, that's I'm the saying the shockwave, wave, yeah. the shockwave in the air would be moving faster than the typical speed of sound in air, but then you would have the speed of the vibrations in the ground would be moving faster than sound, so they would come at all different... Uh, you know, at different times or different, um, yeah. depending on where you were, you might see the light mm-hmm. first and then feel something in the ground and then the air shock wave would right. hit you and then you'd get further reverberations in the ground. And well, yeah, like this account, uh, from the children of Evanach Podi- Podiga who are camped near, uh, out, obviously not within the radius of destruction, but, uh, a ways out that said they were awakened first by a loud rumble. And explosions were heard. Then the earth trembled and there was a loud cracking noise. That was then followed by a terrible storm during which they could hardly keep on their feet. And this flattened the forest near their tent. So that sort of provides a sequence there. They did not actually see the object or the explosion. However, it does say that far away, Towards the north, a kind of cloud was visible. And in fact, some of the accounts would describe something that would be almost, you know, almost like a mushroom cloud. Almost from as if you had a nuclear explosion. I am not saying it was a nuclear explosion, but an explosion on this scale. If you're talking about a 15 megaton explosion, that's, that's a hell of a powerful blast. 
So yeah, then there was the testimony of Semenov that we uh, looked at a little bit where he was um, sitting on the porch uh, at the trading station of Vanavara, which we might pull up a map here in a minute so we can kind of see where that is. And he was looking towards the north. <clears throat> and this, when then he saw the sky, as he s- describes it, split in two. Um, and then high above the forest, the whole northern part of the sky appeared to be covered in fire. And then that was followed by a heat wave that um, was so hot that he wanted to pull off his shirt and throw it away. And then there was a bang in the sky followed by a mighty crash. So he sees the thing first. Um, Then he feels a heat wave and then the bangs and the crashes and the explosions arrive. And it says he was, uh, excuse me, he was thrown to the ground and lost consciousness. Um, and then the crash was followed by noise like stones falling from the sky. The earth trembled. And so when he lay on the ground, he covered his head because he was afraid that stones were going to hit him in the head. So, and then we have testimony of his daughter. And she was the one who said that the fire was brighter than the sun. And during the bangs, the earth and the huts trembled greatly. The noises at first were very loud and seemed to be right above our heads. And then they became quieter and quieter. So, um, yeah, and this this idea of that feeling like the noise is right above their heads, you know, and, and you know, Semenov, who's covering his head because thinks stones are falling right there next to him and are going to hit him in the head. You know, it's interesting that in so many of the meteorite accounts, um, what the people are describing is, you know, oh, this they saw the great meteorite fall, and then it it fell just on the other side of the this hill, right? When in actually it might have fallen 200 miles away. But people do, and, and there's many accounts, and we're going to get into some of those because I have a whole collection of this stuff, which is very interesting. But some of these great meteor events where the the, the fireball is coming over, and obviously it's, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles up, but people are ducking and laying on the ground because they think it's so low that, um, yeah, that, <laughs> that it's going to hit them in the head. And then the other thing is that, now this is interesting too, and this is this has come out in a number of the reports. Now this was from a, a letter received by Leonid Kulik um, by a Namenko who was from the village of Kejma. And he says that the day was unusually clear, no clouds, and there was absolute silence. And he's pointing that out that, that because normally there would be sounds. Morning, early morning, you're going to hear birds. You're going to hear a variety of sounds. There'll probably be a breeze, which is typical for the morning. But he says that um, there was no wind that stirred and there was absolute silence. And you'll find that this is also seems to be um, oftentimes associated with uh, some of these great disasters, including volcanic eruptions, preceded by people commenting on on the unusual silence in the environment. And then all hell breaks loose. Um, Yeah, and then he says, suddenly far off, still hardly audible, was heard the sound of thunder. It made us look up involuntarily in every direction. Um, the sound became rapidly louder. Uh, there was something extraordinary about the sound. The first fairly faint crash resounded, but when I turned quickly in the direction of the crash, I saw that the sun's rays were crossed by a broad, fiery white band on the right side of its rays. On the left side, towards the north, an irregularly shaped brilliant white, somewhat elongated mass was flying into the Taiga with a diameter far greater than the moon. That would be a hell of a thing to see. Yeah. 
Um, so after two or three seconds, after the first faint crash, a second louder crash of thunder resounded, as loud as that generally heard during the storm. Uh, after the second crash, the ball, the fiery ball, was no longer visible, but the tail or streamer had crossed over the sun. Then after a shorter interval of time than that between the first and second crashes, the third thunder crash occurred. And this was so loud that the whole ground trembled. Now that would be something. You hear an explosion so loud that the ground trembles. And an echo, and I like this, picture this, an echo like a continuous deafening roar resounded throughout the taiga. Indeed, it seemed, it seemed, indeed it seemed through the whole taiga of vast Siberia. That would be something to experience. So that's kind of what we, where we left it last week. Then there was the account by Kokorin, who was sailing down the river Angara. He says, in the north, a pale bluish light glowed, and from the south, a fiery body that was considerably larger than the sun. It left a broad streamer that flew across the sky. The first bangs were faint, but they became progressively louder. The sound effect was estimated to have lasted from three to five minutes. And the intensity of the sounds was so great that the boatmen were completely demoralized. Uh huh. And then uh, here's another account from uh, Vakulin, the postmaster. We talked about this, but we'll just pick up the, the thread of where we left off. Um, the first bang was exceptionally loud and accompanied by a whistling noise. So there's a lot of noise of a great wind, uh, the sound of, uh, of a big flock of fluttering birds, a whistling noise. When you go through these accounts, you begin to see, it seemed like there was a lot of audio consequences or audio effects associated with this that were experienced in different ways by different people, depending on where they were relative to the whole event. Yeah, I do have to wonder what would cause a whistling noise. That's I know. I have wondered if it was the ringing in the ears. <clears throat> Could be that. I mean, the other thing I thought of is after the first explosion, you know how, you know, if you've got a, uh, I mean, everybody's heard the ricochet of a bullet. You shoot it, it hits something and goes, right? So yeah. after one explosion, some rock goes off spinning like crazy and maybe making some kind of noise like that. If that passes over the heads of people. It would sound like a whistling, maybe. I don't know. It's interesting. And then from the account by Kokulin, an agriculturist, in a letter to the director of the Irkutsk Observatory, said the Tungusi people wandering around beyond the hamlet of Niz Nizhny Karolinsk say that the thunder was terrible. As, and here from another account, of the peasant Romanov at the beginning of the ninth hour in the morning, local time, a ball of fire appeared in the sky and moved from southeast to northwest. As the ball approached the ground, it first took on a flattened out shape from top to bottom. And just before it struck the ground, it had the appearance of two pillars of fire. When this fiery mass fell onto the ground, the loud crashes like thunder were heard. Then a noise like a strong wind was heard. Okay, that sounds like a... Uh like a lenticular cloud, you know how a, an explosion in the right place in the atmosphere will form a big disc, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. basically. And then if you've got two more flaming pieces coming out from the bottom of that, those are the pillars of fire. That's the picture I get from that description. Uh -huh. Right. And then from the account of Kulesh, who was the director of the Kurinsk Meteorological Station, um, he says that uh, an extraordinary phenomena was observed at 7.15 in the northwest, a pillar of fire appeared in the shape of a spear. Um, and then I think we got to the, to the account of the geologist who, who uh, 
reported that there had been a uh, a stream that appeared uh, right. at the area of the blast. We did talk about that, didn't we? Yeah, the water came up from an area where... Yeah, Ilya Potapovich, who was living at the time at the trading station of Teturia, 25 kilometers to the southwest of Vanovara, told me that at the spot where the meteorite fell, a pit was formed from which a stream flowed to form to join the River Shambe. Ilya Potapovich's brother was living in this region at the time of the fall when his tent flew up into the air like a bird. Some of his reindeer were killed by falling trees, and he himself was deprived of speech for several years. Um, That's eerie. It's is, just, yeah. Yeah. And then there was Golashikin. Uh, he reported in a letter dated June 30th, which, you know, bear in mind that there's two calendars here. The old calendar this event happened on June 17th. So June 30th then would have been 13 days after. Whereas according to our modern calendar, it is June 30th. So, so not to get confused about that. Um, so um, in the village of Kamenskoye, the following phenomena were observed. Subterranean thunder crashes sounded from the Northwest one after the other. Inhabitants felt the ground and buildings shake. From questioning the local inhabitants, he learned that several minutes earlier, some of them had seen an elongated body narrowing towards one end and more than an arshine in length, torn as in an arshine in length, as we found out, is 28 inches. And of course, that's just completely relative to one's perspective. You know, you might look up at the full moon and say, oh, it's half an arshine in length, you know, because you have no framework, you know, other than looking at something, you know, that, 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 um, you know, would encompass that field of view if it was sitting in front of you instead of, you know, a quarter million miles away. But it was says, anyways, an elongated body narrowing towards one end and more than an arshine in length, torn as it were from the sun. So, which again fits with the idea that it came from a radiant point in the sky very near the rising sun. And uh, then a letter to Leonid Kulik from Sobolev, who is the geologist with the Krasnoyarsk Museum. This was in 1924, relating the story by Ilya Potapovich. Fifteen years ago, his brother, that would have been Potapovich's brother, who was a Tungus, Tungus, and could speak a little Russian, lived on the river Shambe. I don't think we, we got into this one. I think this is where we're now getting into some new stuff. One day, a terrible explosion occurred, the force of which was so great that the forest was flattened for many versts along both banks of the river Shambay. Now, a verst is 0.66 miles. So it's roughly, it's a little more about 1.1 kilometer, okay? His brother's hut was flattened to the ground. Its roof was carried away by the wind, and most of his reindeer fled in fright. The noise deafened his brother, and the shock caused him to suffer a long illness. That's a pretty terrible noise. If it's so loud, you go deaf. Now you add that in with the, the subterranean effects, the light and atmospheric effects, you know, the shock. I mean, my God. Yeah, and what do they mean by long illness? Like trauma or something? I mean, shock. Uh, there, you know, I have some I other have stuff wonder, on yeah. that. Uh, not right here. Um, but yeah, he probably some kind of a, a shock-induced illness. Yeah. Maybe it was like a PTSD-type illness. Right. Okay. In the flattened forest at one spot, a pit was formed from which a stream flowed into the river Shambe. The Tunguska road had previously crossed this place, but it was now abandoned because it was blocked, impassable. And this of course is because of the thousands and thousands of trees that are now laying over the road, right? 
but it was now abandoned because it was blocked, impassable, and moreover, the place aroused terror amongst the Tungusi people. The report of the Evanach, Ilya, the Evanach um, tribal member, Ilya Potapovich, about the stream deserves mention. And this is from one of the Russian authors who wrote extensively about um, extraterrestrial events and included a huge section in his book on uh, the Tunguska event. And a lot of these um, accounts are, are from his book, right? Um, a stream, Chergima, actually flows from the place of the fall. This stream is of very ancient origin, as may be judged from its deeply carved out bed in the cliffs, and at one point it has formed a great waterfall. So very suggestive there that we might have been looking at a feature that was created by some past catastrophic floods. One theory is that when the meteorite fell, a stream was formed as the result of the liberation of subterranean waters that had been under pressure. There's another possible assumption, namely that the ancient stream Chergama mentioned above did not exist when the meteorite fell, but its dried up riverbed had been preserved. When the meteorite fell and opened up underground water, the old stream bed was again filled with water and a new stream was formed. Now that to me is a very interesting dimension of this whole possibility that you have this stream that appears. This connection between this atmospheric event, this tremendous pressure, and the liberation of potentially reservoir of underground water. And, and there's, just, is the, I'm sorry, I wasn't completely clear on what was happening there. Are they saying that there was an existing stream bed that was dry? Yes. Because there used to be water there, and then this meteor may have reopened the source? Is that yes. kind of? Okay, yes. all right. Wow, that yeah. is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so then uh, from another uh, account here, on the first, and this is where, um, this is also from a report by Krinov, and this was another interesting side effect of this event, of, of this, of the Tungusi cosmic event. On the first night after the fall of the Tunguska meteorite, from June 30th to July 1st, 1908, and with lesser intensity and a few successive nights, extraordinary optical phenomena were observed in the Earth's atmosphere. Everywhere in Western Siberia and all over Europe, the attention of scientists and of a large number of people was primarily attracted by the unusually bright nights. In fact, it may be said that from June 30th to July 4th, July 1st, there was no night at all. At the same time, massive, glowing, silvery clouds were seen against a background of brilliant, colorful sunsets. So something yeah. has happened in the atmosphere. There's yeah, kind of a, an after effect. And, um, it sounds like noctilucent clouds. Yeah. So now I'm going to show a, I'm going to do a screen share here. Uh, and I have a map of Western Siberia all the way over to England and the British Isles. These are locations where anomalously bright nights were reported following the Tunguska event of June 30th. So that opens up some interesting questions about what's going on there. And, and to me, the most likely explanation, there have been a number of variants offered, but the one is that if it was a piece of a comet, it may have brought in with it a lot of gases, volatile gases and so on that, you know, were brought into the atmosphere with it. And it is these gases in the atmosphere that are producing the unusual optical phenomena that was seen. Um, and, of course, 
at the time, all of this, this unusual optical phenomena is being seen and witnessed by people in Europe. They don't know what's just happened over in Siberia, right? It's not until years later that researchers put two and two together and go, wait a second. Oh, look at this. In the, in the, for several nights right after the Tunguska cosmic event, you had these anomalously bright nights all over Europe. Even to the point, as they're saying, for the first two nights afterwards, almost like there was no night at all. And the people did, in fact, think that was pretty strange. Um, I'm going to jump back to images here while I've got the screen share going. This was, I'm trying to remember where this came from, but this, I think, was actually sketched out by one of the witnesses or based Maybe it was like a, 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 a relative of somebody that lived through it that described it. I think that was it. Uh, hopefully, I can come up with the source of this. Um, but it kind of really shows the effect, you know, of the, the great explosion and the shock wave sweeping oh, yeah. over the ground and just blowing everything over. Wow. You can see, obviously, see the 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 the, the can probably presumably some tungusis there getting thrown about you see here their hut is being thrown up you see the reindeer are running running panicking away you see the trees snapped off the shock wave is moving across and will soon shear these trees off right at the ground Oof. yeah yeah we have a couple of things to share here one Good. one of these is a uh, um is hold on where is that it's one of these is one of my favorite artists impressions of what they think the explosion may have looked like you know from up from up in the sky okay uh, some of you may have seen this before yes i have seen that yeah, so there's multiple impact, you know, explosions. This is the first one here, right. probably, and then more and more, and then it just keeps expanding, and then there's the shock wave coming out. Mm-hmm. And that's a now I this know, is I like, interesting. This domed effect. Yeah, that that shock wave has hit the ground is now mm-hmm. rebounding somehow. Rebounding, right? Yeah. The other one Kyle pulled up here. These are noctilucent clouds. Um, well, I may have to stop. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see how bright they are. Yeah. They're supposedly they're made by ice crystals that are way up in the atmosphere, mm-hmm. so the sun can keep them lit for a long time after it goes down. Yeah, and that was I think that's one of the speculations as to the anomalously white nights. Yeah. Um, if it if it left crystals. a lot of material, yeah, yeah left if it lo- blanketed the upper atmosphere with ice crystals or whatever, you know. Yeah. From the blast, because you know that that pressure is going to crystallize a lot of water vapor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's see here. Let's uh, look at uh, this guy who we've been talking about, Leonid Kulik. Um, is that a synchronicity? His name is Leonid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, apparently, <laughs> apparently so. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll do a share screen here. I need some glasses like that. He reminds me a little bit of of a, a Bulgarian that works for me named Boris. Yeah. So here is uh, Kulik's, as it says, this is crossing the Taiga. Kulik's intrepid team dragging boats across rapids on the river Kushmo to reach the site of the great explosion. And notice that they're wearing these face masks. Those are actually there for the, uh, because of the mosquitoes. If they you've mis- never been, if you'd be surprised. I, I spent four years in Alaska when my dad was in the Air Force. Mosquitoes, you wouldn't think of in a place like Alaska or Siberia. Right. Mosquitoes are awful in those places. Oh, oh wow. I'm sure. Yes. Well, I've heard them referred to as flying alligators. <laughs> so. yeah. Sounds pretty bad. Oh, <laughs> well, we had them in Minnesota. 
maybe not as bad. Because look, 10,000 lakes, which is actually 15,000, you got a few mosquitoes. I mean, you've got hundreds of mosquitoes. Quite a few people warned us about that going up to Lake Nipigon, you know, just north of there in the summer. They said that bugs were just awful. Wait yeah. until later in the fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, so this, as I said, I think last last episode, the the undertaking to dis, to get to the the site of the blast was truly a heroic enterprise and would be worthy of at least a documentary, but even more so a a, a you know a, a Hollywood treatment to show. I mean, these guys, what they had to go through, I mean, and they made several efforts too, um, and had to turn back under the most harrowing conditions. And of course, they only had a little narrow window to make this, this heroic trek to get there before the, the, the seasonal window closed. Once the rains came in, then the rivers would become so swollen that they would just get swept away. But then they thought, well, maybe there's an interval where the rivers are frozen. Maybe we can travel by sled. And I mean, the whole the whole ex, uh, enterprise of getting there, which took several efforts because um, they didn't succeed the first time. Um, quite an amazing story. And maybe we get into that a little bit in the, in one of the upcoming episodes. A little bit of the uh, uh, the hardships that they underwent to finally get there, to, to finally get to the, to the site of the blast. And then from the diary of Leonid Kulik, this is always worth reading and rereading because this is when he finally gets there after weeks and weeks and months of, of, of struggle and hardship. I still cannot sort out my chaotic impressions of this excursion. From our observation point, no sign of forest can be seen. For everything has been devastated and burned. One has an uncanny feeling when one sees 20-inch, 30-inch thick giant trees snapped across like twigs and their tops hurled many meters away. The results of even a cursory examination exceeded all the tales of the eyewitnesses and my wildest expectations. I, I always get get goosebumps when I read that and try yeah, to imagine. Gives you, gives you chills. Yeah, it does. Is, it does. is that available or just little excerpts or is that in a book somewhere? His well, I think that this was probably from Krinov. Um, because uh, yeah, I guess that would be critical to recreate in a movie. Well, it certainly would. Yeah. Now it's not letting me out. We're kind of at our halfway point. You want to get that straightened out after after a little break? Well, we could. I although I just actually got it straightened out. Um, run with it. Let's run with it. Okay, so I'm going to run through a sequence of images here. They're not great images, but it'll 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 help to kind of um, convey uh, the overall impression. And let's see. So we will go to back to the share screen. And this is the most famous, I think, of the of the photographs that you see the most often. I searched around to try to get the highest resolution version of it that I could find. You got a picture. You've got about 820 square miles of this. And it went from literally thick, overgrown taiga forest, huge trees, to literally a minute later, this. And here you see the forest devastation. Uprooted trees standing in the foreground, stripped of branches, were protected from the blast wave by the hill in the background. But all over the hill, you see these trees that are snapped off and laid, o laid over. So this maybe tells you something that, you know, uh, for survival, you probably want to be at a, somewhere low, concealed behind, like it says here, a hill. More forest devastation. 
And this is the view towards the Chakrama Mountain, which was first witnessed by Kulik from the Clodney Ridge in the winter of 1927. The entire field of view was decimated by the blast and is here now beginning to regenerate um, in, the, you know, in the late 1920s. But so basically when he mounted this ridge, he looked out and as far as the eye could see was nothing but devastation to the horizon in all directions. So yeah, you can understand how he had an uncanny feeling. And it was 20 years later. This, this is like 20, I guess, um, this is probably a picture he took on his expedition in 27. So like 19 years later, or at least 19 years later, I don't know for certain when this photograph was taken, but it was taken on one of those early expeditions. This is a picture of his base camp in the winter of 2930. The hillside was completely stripped by the blast, and here new young growth can be seen emerging. Now, this is interesting, right? This is the Suslav Hole, as it's called, after uh, one of the team members. In, the May of, in May of 1929, after being drained by Kulik and his team, well, you'll notice what it is. It's a shallow elliptical depression and held a body of water. They assumed that it was an impact crater. And so they spent a lot of time excavating and cutting troughs through it, looking for evidence of a meteor, but found none. And this is another one of the old grainy photographs. Uh, the northwest part of what they called the cauldron, which was the central sort of depression area that was completely decimated by the blast. Um, however, if you look out there, there are a series of shallow elliptical basins and lakes under the epicenter. So this was from, I think, Roy Gallant's or Gallant's expedition in the 1980s um, when Americans did some of their first actual, American scientists actually got to the site for the first time. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, over 80, roughly 80 years after the fact. So all of these trees up here are going to be new trees, and these are going to be the remnants of trees that were blown down in the blast. And then this is the so-called South Swamp, which is ground zero. And there's not much left there. So this, I'm assuming, would have been pretty much incinerated. Those look like ripples. Is that what that is? Or is this just snow pattern? I think it's snow pattern. Okay. I think it's snow pattern. So the South Swamp then is within the cauldron. Yes. Cauldron's a broader area. Yeah. Yeah. And here's, again, one of the many oval crater swamps there, that they called them. Kulik found near the epicenter. Uh, and then I say, note the forest devastation on the hill in the background. Up here, you can see all the flattened trees. So, again, this is still, you know, 20 years after the effect. And the cauldron as it appeared in the 1980s. So you can see it's beginning to, it's done a lot of regenerating. Um, and uh, give it another century or two, and you probably wouldn't know that this thing had ever happened there. That's an important insight to take away from this. Something that can be this devastating, this profound, and this destructive, and yet a few centuries later, you're not going to really know that it happened unless you go to the proxies, which we, the kind of, the kinds of things that we've been talking about in the recent episodes. And uh, we'll get to that because there were proxies produced during the Tungusa event, Tungusi event that have their parallels with proxies produced during the Younger Dryas boundary event. And just another old grainy photograph, I suppose, taken by the air. But here again, you can see the elliptical depressions in the ground beneath the blast zone. 
And here's, yeah, here's a photo by Roy Gallant. One of the small, neat, and this is the actual uh, uh, caption. One of the small, neat oval bogs that Kulik er erroneously presumed to be secondary craters of the fragmented meteorite. This one was named after the ethnographer Suslov. But again, what does this sort of remind you of? Well, if you say erroneously, if, if they're not secondary craters, what are they? <laughs> they look like Carolina Bays. Carolina Bays. They do. Well, that's the question, Mike. You just asked. Well, that. well, well. Then Carolina Bays wouldn't they sort of by definition be secondary <laughs> craters? Well, the reason they're saying it's not a secondary crater is because when they did these uh, extensive excavations, what they they didn't find anything. They didn't find pieces of a meteorite that they thought they would find. And of course, again, paralleling the Carolina Bays, excavations of the Carolina Bays have not resulted in finding any meteorites. I see. Right. So the now the question is, were these things already here or are they somehow the product of this explosion? Yeah, they're like secondary effects. Maybe so, second, yeah. Secondary craters. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and here you're, you're looking here again. Yeah, photograph of the crater swamps found in the area beneath the epicenter of the blast. So uh, you have these elliptical crater swamps that, again, first thing that comes to mind, anybody who has is familiar with the Carolina Bays can't help but be reminded. So is there a connection there? Is there a genetic connection? Has well, anybody mapped the orientations of those uh, elliptical not, depressions? Good question. Not that I know of. The other thing is that Siberia, I don't know if it's this area, but it's like, especially recently has become sort of interesting in the fact that like sinkholes just appear out of nowhere. Uh, so I wonder if the blast may have caused some collapses underground that these, and then they, they, they show up as these, you know, elliptical things in the ground there are sinkholes that are filled in with material i don't know i'm just guessing that's, that's sort of where i was going to go because if, if it's a, out in the middle of the siberian traps though that was what 250 some million years ago uh i don't yeah. know how far beneath how much soil is on top of that over 250 million years right but yeah there could be some product uh of of underground something shifted and yeah like a sinkhole yeah well, let's get into that a little bit, the idea of the Siberian traps and the connection there, if any, uh, when we get back from the break. Sounds great. Perfect. All right. Welcome back. Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And continuing on with Tunguska, where are we going, Randall? Well, we're all uh, we've got a, we've got some buses chartered. We're going to get all of our listeners together, and we're going to just head on to Siberia um, with our masks. With our masks, for mosquitoes. Yes, mosquito, mosquito masks. We'll uh, we'll have to arrange for uh, ferries across the Bering Strait. <laughs> awesome. Well, who Fair knows? We we'll could, see ho. Yeah, I mean, maybe... Darren at GrimeAmerica.com <laughs> to sign up. Yeah. Yes, call Darren and let get, put him to work on it. Can we get some of those boats with the flat beds and the giant fans? That's how I want to do it. I think we should get out there in style. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Swamp boats. The swamp swamp boats. Bo swamp boat, yeah. yeah. Swamp boats. Yeah, we had those in Louisiana. Definitely. All right. Well, I'm going to do a share screen here, and we're going to look at an aerial photograph of one of these uh, oval features that I find so intriguing. Um, once again, I can't help but noticing a similarity to the Carolina dun, 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 Bays. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Carolina Bays. Now, the question is, are these oval features that are found in this blast area associated, is their origin a function of the blast because if so the fact that there are no macroscopic specimens of the meteorite or the comet piece found then we can't go from there and then say well because we're not finding 
um, macroscopic pieces of meteorite in the Carolina Bays, that that therefore excludes them possibly being somehow connected with a cosmic event. Now, Brad and I have what we've we hung out in that in the uh, round table a year and a half ago, two years right. ago, when we were with Chris Moore. He has his ideas on the origin of the bays. Davies has his ideas on the origin of the bays. Dave, Davius, 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 and uh, Davius. yeah, I just want to mention he's he's the one that's got so many of those extraordinary. Yeah, uh, lidar images. So that's at sintos.org, and I put that in the uh, in the show notes several times. So I'll add that again. But yeah, those are just amazing to look at. They are amazing, Michael Davius. Yeah, because it's really showing up what these the 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 things that are lying concealed in the landscape, and and which to me is so amazing because it's it's just further proof of what we've kind of been talking about for decades is that yeah, there's a whole a whole landscape, a whole story engraved into the global landscape that's just been hidden from our sight for millennia. And now we are, we're developing through technology and through, um, you know, secondary perceptions through, you know, uh, scanning electron microscopy and energy dispersive spectroscopy and so on. These new technologies, we're beginning to see things that we couldn't see before, both microscopic and macroscopic. And this, the LIDAR stuff that, that Davius, is that how you say his name again? I Davius. Davius. Yeah. That he's come up with is, um, is amazing. Like you said. Um, and then are there, are, are, Oh, go ahead. Are there, are there features like this that aren't in the blast zone in well, Siberia? See, that is the next question. And yeah, so far I, to my knowledge, no, there's not. Okay. And that's, but I don't know. I, I don't want to say definitively no, there's not, because right. I don't know. Um why aren't there why aren't there trees in it? Is it just too wet? I mean, I you probably I don't know if you know, but it's just strange to me why it's so empty. Right. right. Yes. I, I, I mean, what, what would be what yeah, it's, yeah, it could be a bog, but trees can grow in swamps. Yeah, and that's I, I, in the case strange. of the Carolina Bays, you know, they've got lots of it's because of the the so called bay tree. Actually, yeah, that they're called bays, not yeah. bays right. like inlets on the coastline, but bays after the bay tree that yes. grows pro- prolifically in the in the swampy depressions that are yeah. the characteristic that just, bays. That just looks suspiciously barren. It does look sus- suspiciously barren. Yeah, and I'm wondering if uh, you know the the soil was sterilized or something. Yeah, it could be that. Yeah, by a heat wave the microbiome or microbiome uh, is dead. But after 80 years, you'd think I know. it would be replenished. Well, the grasses will come back first. Yeah, true. Yeah. Well, if anyone That's, has any 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 thoughts on that, you know, share well, them share them with us because you know, this is still a mystery. We you know, it hasn't been resolved yet whether this is a piece of a comet or an asteroid, although I'm leaning more towards a comet and given what we know about comets and the nature of comets from the last few decades, there's not a clear dividing line between comets and asteroids anymore. I mean, there's a whole gradation of, of beasts between the two that are kind of almost hybrids. And that's something else we will look at um, and try to learn more about. But yeah, a lot of devolatized comet nuclei almost appear more asteroid-like than, than they do comets, a typical yeah. icy body. Although comet yeah. nuclei do have a lot of ice. So anyway. I think LIDAR, LIDAR and something like this would be interesting, too, because I would be interested to know if it's actually larger than the vegetation implies. In other words, has it been shrinking since? Yeah. Like, have the, have the trees been growing inwards? Encroaching, yeah. yeah. Interesting ages, question, yeah. because, you know, some of the um, features that Brad and I have been investigating in the field, flood-caused features, for example, the Hickory Run Boulder Field and the Blue Rocks Boulder Field, which are both... Um, Right. Also known as singing rocks up in Pennsylvania are good examples where you can, and we'll have pictures of this, you know, in an upcoming episode where people will be able to see some, some of these features, but almost certainly produced by a, uh, uh, an oversaturated uh, matrix of material moving 
almost on a horizontal plane, but choked with boulders. And one of the things is, is that you'll, you might see an area that's a hundred yards or 200 yards wide of just barren boulders. The trees are growing at the edge, but if you go over to the edge and you go into the trees, you realize that the boulder field is much wider than the barren area between the trees. And just like you were, you said there, Russ, the trees are encroaching and probably in a few more centuries or another millennia, you'll eventually have this whole uh, barren boulder field completely grown over. And then eventually soil will, will fill in the, the interstices between the rocks and you get a layer of soil and, 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 you know, a thousand years from now, 2000 years from now, you might, it might be difficult to know that you're actually walking on this lag deposit of these thousands, tens of thousands of huge boulders that you're are talking about, forming the upper layer of the landscape. You're talking about Ringing Rocks Park? Is that what you're referencing there in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Yeah. You, you've been there? No, but I, I've studied it. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's very yeah, interesting. Yeah we, yeah, we we went there. We went to a couple of those. And that was one of the things that I immediately saw was, well, okay, you look at the thing and, and, and it looks this wide, but it actually extends up under the forest for a considerable, like twice the width of what you're actually seeing. Yeah. So yeah, the forest is in, encroaching upon it. But yeah, I think what Kyle was, the point he was making, we, so we've set enormous fires, you know, when you've got a pile of dead trees and you burn them down, uh -huh. you, you burn them, it'll leave a barren area. Uh -huh. That fire is so hot. You know, when you burn a huge pile of dead trees, it can burn so hot that it kills the biome in the soil sometimes several feet down uh -huh. and it'll leave a, it'll, it, so then all the grasses start growing back up and there's this giant circle that won't grow anything sometimes for years. Um, so yeah, there's places we've, we cleared and burned and I mean, back in, I don't know, 10 years ago now, and you can go there and still see the rings, still see the circles where, it, I mean, they grow certain things start coming up in those rings, really? but it's, it's different vegetation at yeah. first than what the normal, you know, predominant vegetation is in the area. Yeah. So if it, you know, if a normal, like a, a, a pile of trees fire that people can set on the ground can do that for years. I imagine if there are certain areas in that where, where incredible heat actually impacted the ground itself. Right. Actually flash fr flash fried all of the microbiome that lives in the soil down to the bedrock. That may take a long time for the for the vegetation to, to reclaim it because the soil itself is just dead and sterile. There's no. Uh huh. So, well, just yeah. an idea. So yeah. may maybe that's what we're looking at here. I'd like to walk in there with a Geiger counter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell you what I'm going to do. I went ahead and pulled up a. Uh, picture of the boulder stream so people just can see what we're talking about yeah uh, um you might you might find this interesting too uh russ since you you've studied it here let me share screen so in the time that we've got left let's let's get back to um the Tunguska event. So um, this is from one of the early, this was in published, what I'm about to, to read to you now is um, published in 1931, J.G. Crowther in Scientific American. And this is now, of course, when, when a lot of this knowledge is now coming to American scientists for the first time, right? So he writes, many other reports referred to the devastation of the forest and the felling of the trees in uniform directions, one to the destruction of several Tungus families and one to a forest fire. The Tungus' terror of the district will be understood when I report that Professor Kulik told me the occurrence had caused the evolution of a new tribal religion. They regarded the arrival of the meteorite as a visitation from a god named Agdi, meaning fire to punish the wicked. The place is believed to be accursed. So that was way back in 1931. 
Then in 1996, uh, Kevin Zonley, uh, an astronomer, wrote uh, uh, an article in Nature entitled, Leaving No Stone Unburned. And he starts out his article by saying that perhaps the earliest wild, widely held theory for the Tunguska explosion was that the world was about to end. Now that was, yeah, that was the impression of a whole lot of these people that witnessed this thing was, this is it. This is, it's over. The world is now going to be destroyed. There's no way that we can be experiencing something this powerful that is not the end of the world. The Tunguska impactor exploded above a sparsely inhabited region in central Siberia with the force of a 15 megaton bomb. The blast wave flattened trees over 2,000 square kilometers and excited a magnitude 5 earthquake. Thermal radiation scorched trees and set fires over much of the range and even 70 kilometers, which is about 45 miles away, an observer removed his shirt for fear it would ignite. He goes on to say that the earliest scientific expeditions to the impact site launched almost two decades after the event concentrated on the search for meteorites, but no meteorite was found. Instead, the explorers found a huge region of trees felled in a striking radial pattern, at the center of which they found standing trees stripped of branches. Apparently, the meteor exploded in the air. So recent attention has focused on whether the Tunguska body was a comet or an asteroid, which gets us back to that, um, that controversy. And then finally, he says, at present, there are two reports of possible debris. One is a modest iridium excess in local peat. The other, a relatively high abundance of microscopic dust particles embedded in tree resins exposed between 1902 and 1920 in local conifers that survived the explosion. These may prove to be extraterrestrial but neither is likely to determine the exact type of impactor. Uh, so then there was um, a Russian scientist, Andrei Yulolkhovatov. Uh, sorry, I don't speak Russian, so my, my pronunciation is probably way screwy. He wrote... Um, in uh, a Russian publication that was translated in 2003, he comes up with, a, with an alternate theory, which I don't necessarily accept, but it brings up and points to a very interesting coincidence. From the geological aspect, the Tunguska uh, event occurred in a rather remarkable place in the southern part of the Siberian platform. It was the place of some of the most powerful volcanic activity in Earth's history 250 million years ago, a former hot spot. The area is rich in various gas, oil, and ore deposits, including rare earth elements and platinoids. There are kimberlites in the region, too. The upper mantle in this region has anomalous speeds of seismic waves. The Tunguska epicenter is right in the middle of the Paleovolcano crater. I find that interesting. You know, it's almost like the Tunguska event is pinpointing this specific spot on the surface of the earth where you had one of the largest, if not the largest volcanic hist event known in the history of the planet. Kimberlite pipes are pipes that come up and they, uh, under tremendous pressure. You know, diamonds are often found in kimberlite pipes. Um, I think um, Kyle is looking up kimberlite pipe for us, even as we speak. Of course. And the upper mantle in this region has anomalous speeds of seismic waves. So maybe the tectonic nature of this area had something to do with the the impression that eyewitnesses had of of there being a subterranean component to the event 
Okay, so kimberlite is an igneous rock, mm -hmm. which sometimes contains diamonds. Mm -hmm. It is named after the town of Kimberley in South Africa, mm. where the discovery of an 83.5 carat diamond called the Star of South Africa in 1869 spawned a diamond rush. Mm. But uh, I don't see kimberlite pipes. Yeah, there he goes. Kim kimberlite. Occurs in the Earth's crust and vertical structures known as kimberlite pipes, as mm -hmm. well as igneous dikes. Mm -hmm. Also occurs as, well, also occurs as horizontal sills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sill is horizontal, pipe yeah. is vertical. And so what you have is a magmatic intrusion I I into a, 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 the crust. Yeah, it says the consensus is they are formed deep in the mantle. Yeah. At 150 to 450 kilometers below the surface, and... Hmm. They are erupted rapidly and violently. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So this, the Tunguska event, was dead center on this paleo, this ancient, deeply eroded paleovolcanic crater, which undoubtedly played a large part in causing the greatest mortality event in the history of life on earth the so-called great dying at about 251 million years ago the permian at the permian triassic boundary and when we talk about the great mass extinctions in earth history and their possible causes of course we are going to talk more about the permian triassic and then we had the um I guess I'm going to do a, another screen share here so we can see um, the micro barograms. So, Real quick, can I ask yeah, a question? I, want, I have a question about uh, the anomalous speeds of seismic waves. Is that what he was saying? Yeah. What? Uh, I'm presuming because of the density of the basaltic terrain, we're probably looking at accelerated accelerated speeds yeah huh but that's just a guess now i would i would want to research that further which i have not done that's why i've said for years i need to be like four people not just one person <laughs> that's why you haven't researched this yet randall what's wrong with you <laughs> well <laughs> well i know that contrary to what you may think about me I'm actually not perfect. <laughs> oh. <That's>, uh, <laughs> Podcast over. I'm done. Uh, no, I got a ways to go yet. Maybe about 450,000 more lifetimes, and then I'll be there. Perfection. All Perfection. Right. Yeah. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, uh, screen share. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So here are the microbarograms that had been recently installed in England at uh, six English meteor meteorological stations from the morning of June 30th, 1908. And basically what you see here is the shock wave passing over England that morning, registering on the, the microbarographs, but nobody knowing what's causing this anomalous pressure pulse that's passing over England. And here you see a composite barogram showing the multiple wave fronts passing over England. And this is after Fred Whipple. Um, so yeah, this, this, is, this is the pressure waves in the atmosphere that encircle the Earth twice. And so here are some of the observed characteristics, just sort of a bullet list of the things I've put together through reading the various accounts and so on the observed characteristics of the Tunguska event, a ball of fire brighter than the sun, multicolored, often rainbow streamers forming a tail, the sky opens up, fire pours out, or sky split in two, deafening thunder, extremely loud crashes, bangs, etc. subterranean trembling slash shaking like locomotives passing below, Sense of heavy beams or stones striking the ground. Ground and buildings shaking. Intense pressure blast wave. Extreme heat pulse. And a pillar of fire and pillar of smoke. 
So those are some of the characteristics. Then there are secondary effects, which we have only looked at a few of those. Um, for example, one of them was the anomalous optical and atmospheric effects, the white nights, the sky glows, noctilucent clouds, etc. But there were also uh, intense and prolonged solar halos in the aftermath. And there were heavy, intense meteorological and precipitation events over all over Europe in the days after. Um, there was also a de decrease in atmospheric transparency detected in the U.S., like as if the, the atmosphere was loaded with something. Uh, and we won't really so much get into this because um, it gets kind of technical. We'd have to devote more time to it, but I'll point it out anyway, that there were disturbances in the points of neutral polarization in the scattering of sunlight, which is a direct function of atmospheric turbulence. Uh, and there has also been found magnetic microspherals uh, that have now been found deposited in the regional soils. Um, and let's see, what were some of the others? Yeah, so there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on. Uh, enhancement of carbon-13 and iridium in peat layers associated with the catastrophe. Extremely rapid recovery of forest after the catastrophe, an accelerated growth in trees surviving the catastrophe. The trees that survived the catastrophe underwent a growth spurt. And there was also, and this is a lot of this is in Russian, and I wish more of it would get translated in English, but there was a sharp increase in genetic mutation of plants, possibly animals, in the area of the catastrophe. So, yeah, a lot of interesting things going on there. Um, you know, back in 1930, the, 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 the great Fred Whipple, who was one of the godfathers of comet scientists, wrote uh, in the Quarterly Journal of the Royal Meteorological Society um, an article. Uh, again, one of the early articles published in English about the Tunguska event. It's entitled, The Great Siberian Meteor and the Waves seismic and aerial, which it produced. So he says, there are many marvelous features in the story of the Siberian meteor, a story without parallel in historic times. It is most remarkable that such an event should occur in our generation and yet be so nearly ignored. No civilized man sought out the falling place of the meteor for 20 years and even now, no one has followed up the track of the pioneer. That was in 1930. This paper has been devoted to the incidental effects, and it is therefore appropriate to emphasize two coincidences. Seismographs were in readiness to demonstrate that earth waves can be produced by the impact of a meteor with the ground. Now, at, in 1930, they were still thinking that there was maybe a, a, an actual impact of the ground. However, we could, we could now rewrite that sentence to say that seismographs are in ready to, readiness to demonstrate that earth waves can be produced by the impact of a meteor with the atmosphere, right? Microbarographs had been invented just in time to preserve records of the airwaves generated in the atmosphere. If the meteor had fallen even five years earlier, there would have been no evidence for the spreading of the airwaves beyond the immediate locality of the fall. If it had fallen 20 years earlier, we should know nothing. We should have known nothing of the earth waves. So timing wise, it's good that it happened when it did. You know, like it says, and, and, and because of that, because of what we know about what happened to the atmosphere, it's the atmospheric response as well as the seismic response has really provided a lot of insight into the nature of this event, without which we'd still be um, scrambling to try to make sense out of it. Then in 1976, uh, one of the very first books I read uh, on the event, I mean, I actually remember hearing about this event probably even as a kid, but but I think I, I read my first book was The Fire Came By by John Baxter and Thomas Atkins, published in 1976. 
had an introduction by uh, Isaac Asimov. And uh, he says in his introduction, he says, once and only once. Now, before I read that, let's consider the location we've already seen is interesting because it almost seems to target dead center onto this paleo volcano that was one of the largest, most disruptive, explosive events in the history of the planet, endogenic from within the planet. And so, and then we have what Whipple is pointing out that the timing was, was coincidental in that had it happened 20 years earlier, we would have known nothing about either the seismic waves or the aerial atmospheric phenomena, right? Now, Isaac Asimov says, once and only once in known history was there a clear and documented event that looked as though a large meteorite had fallen on Earth. It took place only seven decades ago in 1908 in Siberia. It was an amazing fall. On the one hand, it did enormous damage, for it fell in a forest and knocked down every tree for scores of miles in every direction. On the other hand, it did very little damage, for it killed not one human being. Consider how unusual that had to be. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. If that fall had taken place anywhere in the ocean, tsunamis would have, been, uh, would have washed the nearer shores and could have done much damage. Another 10% of the Earth's surface is covered by permanent ice. If the fall had taken place there, enough melting might have come about to cause the slippage of large quantities of ice into the ocean, bringing about catastrophic changes in Earth's sea level and climate. And what's interesting there is he's describing precisely a Heinrich event when, you know, the document did uh, evidence now of there being episodes where huge amounts of, of glacial ice are disgorging into the oceans, right? With no clear explanation on what's driving these events for these massive armadas of icebergs to be discharged out in, into the ocean. He goes on to say that at least 15% of what is left of Earth's surface is populated more or less thickly with human beings and is littered more or less thoroughly with the products of their civilization. If the fall had taken place there, anywhere from hundreds to millions of people would have been killed, and anywhere from thousands to billions of dollars of damage would have been inflicted. The fall would have completely wiped out any city it had struck. Perhaps not more than 5% of the surface of the earth could have received that 1908 blow without any damage at all being done to human life and property. And with the odds 20 to 1 against it, that fall took place safely from the human standpoint. By the same token, though, the place in which the fall occurred was inaccessible or else it would have been populated, and it was years before the vicinity could be examined. It was only then that the real mystery began. Consider that the fall managed to find that one in 20 place where it would do no damage, almost as though someone was humanely trying to avoid question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, and then back to Kevin Zonley in his 1996 article, Leaving No Stone Unburned. He says that small impact craters on Earth are almost always produced by the relatively rare iron meteorites. The 1.2 kilometer meteor crater in Arizona, for example, was produced by an iron body of essentially the same energy as the Tunguska explosion. The smallest crater known to be made by a chondrite is the 3.4 kilometer New Quebec crater. This raises a problem for the comet theory. If comets with energies of 15 megatons can reach the troposphere before exploding, then the much more numerous stony asteroids, which all models agree will penetrate deeper, should be cratering the land every thousand years. If Tunguska was a comet, where are all the meteor craters made by rocks? 
Hmm. Then Z.V. Svetsov in 2006, writing uh, and uh, had a paper appear in the Lunar and Planetary, in the uh, journal Lunar and Planetary Science. Thermal, title of paper, Thermal Radiation on the Ground from Large Aerial Bursts Caused by Tunguska-like Impacts. The impacts of cosmic bodies from tens to hundreds of meters in size can produce aerial bursts and leave no craters on the ground. This occurred in the 1908 Tunguska event in central Siberia when a comet or asteroid 50 to 100 meters in diameter entered the atmosphere and released its energy at altitudes of 5 to 10 kilometers. Thermal radiation from the Tunguska fireball ignited a forest in an area of about 200 square kilometers. Estimates for grazing impacts of bodies about one kilometer in size show that thermal irradiation can ignite dry wood and other inflammables and melt soil in a strip hundreds of kilometers long and 100 kilometers wide. Um, so one of the points here that I think is important is that, you know, Zonley raised the question about um, why we're not seeing more craters on the size of the um, meteor crater in Arizona. Now, of course, one answer again is the fact that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. So we're not going to see a crater there. If an object the size of a, of a, 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 a meteor crater impactor fell, you know, let's say in the rainforests of, of South America, anytime within the last couple of centuries, we're probably not going to see it. Although we are going to look at evidence that in the 1930s, there was a Tunguska-like event uh, over Brazil, okay? Aerial bursts, not ground impacts, aerial bursts. Here's the thing, though. The iron objects that leave the visible craters are much less abundant than the lower density objects that might detonate in the atmosphere. And this is important, I think, because what it's suggesting to us is that aerial bursts along the lines of Tunguska or even Chelyabinsk may be way more abundant than anybody was imagining even a few decades ago. And that is something to that really to, to, to take into consideration. Um, is, is that because you're saying the... Uh... You're saying that's because there are more of the the comet type than the, yes. than the metalloid rocky that's types. A, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. So, Brad's got his hat on. All right, he's this been is wearing a, it a while. Looking like a, Freddy Krueger. This is an <laughs> omen. Yes. All right. Well, let's sum up here. Uh, very interesting phenomena. Tunguska, 1908, June thirtieth. We'll pick up, we'll look at the evidence that it might have been a member of the Torrid meteor stream and the significance of that, because it happens to actually be very significant. And that'll have a connection back to the Younger Dryas potential impact event that we've been talking about. Uh, because what the evidence is pointing to, the circumstantial evidence, is that if there were a cluster of uh, a b clustered bombardment episode, at the Younger Dryas boundary, the source of that, those objects, may have been the same source as the Tunguska object in 1908. Now, to me, that's really, really an interesting possibility. Um, so we have the fact the timing is interesting, right? The timing is interesting. Um, you know, um, the fact that it occurred just when it did in terms of our technological capabilities of perceiving the event. The placement, he, uh, what Asimov doesn't really mention there, though, is that if it was a little further north, it would have been out of the Taiga and into the tundra. If it was out of the Taiga, we would not have had the radial tree pattern that basically was the clear, conclusive proof that something of enormous power happened there, you see. And what we were able to learn about the nature of the shock wave and, 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 and the, the temperatures and things by studying the, the fallen trees. And now also the, the, the finding of 
of possibly microspherals embedded in the resin of trees that survived. That's extremely interesting stuff too. Um, so the placement of it is 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 unique. You know, my point being is is that all those factors that Isimov is is uh, invoking there. Once you've excluded all those possibilities, you know, now there's not that many places where you could drop a thing like that and, uh, you know, come in, you know, 20 years to 100 years later and begin to extract the lessons from that residual evidence. So it's very, there are coincidences connected with this event, you know, and then the fact that it, like dead center targeted on that ancient paleo volcano to me, it's just, just maybe, yeah, probably just a coincidence, but I don't know. You know, it also, it also does imply possibly that there's just a lot more of these that happen that we have no records of, right? That one's so unique that there's all this evidence of it. Whereas what you're pointing out is in most other places where that could take place and there just wouldn't be any evidence even a year later, you know, or, or if it happened over the ocean, there would be almost no evidence of it. Right. Other than perhaps an anomalous tsunami. Yeah. I don't, I, way, I don't think that Tunguska it. evidence uh, would, would, would generate a tsunami that would cause extreme disruption. Um, right. But it might cause like a rogue wave kind uh, of thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. A rogue wave kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're still learning. I, you know, I've got a lot of catch up. There's been some new stuff published in the last few years that I've not been able to really absorb yet. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that through the, 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 these podcasts, you know, we, we stimulate a lot of interest and, you know, people start doing research themselves. And then if they find interesting things, they can get back because really there's so much now that needs to be, uh, studied and then integrated into this uh, this newly emerging model of global change uh, that it's going to take more than just our small group sitting here. And, and, and it's not, I mean, there are people who are really beginning to uh, come together around the, the exploration of these ideas and realizing that, that these past events, the, the repercussions of these events may still be playing out in things that are happening today in the world today. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll pick up and we'll begin looking at the the evidence that the um, that the Tunguska event was part of the Torrid Stream, and then we'll come back and and we'll look at uh, at the possible connections between the Younger Dryas boundary event that we've been looking at in such tremendous depth, and uh, the, the possibility of the Torrid Meteor Stream being a, a, a key factor in that. And then also, where this will also get really interesting, is is in the um, looking at some of these archaic traditions uh, that seemed to be um, based upon uh, people, ancient peoples uh, believing that the Torrid meteors were somehow uh, important. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that idea. So, um, and next week I'll, I'll give a report. I've, next week I will have been using this new high potency CBD oil and checking that out um, because I think that, you know, there's so many things emerging now that people can use to enhance their life um, and things that we can be taking advantage of um, that I would like to see kind of spread amongst our community of people that are doing this kind of research because um, we need to be healthy and we need to be planning to, to live and work for decades to come because there's that much work ahead of us. So that's all I have to say for tonight. We are oh, receiving you. all kinds of contributions from people telling us about current scientific papers, yep. linking us to videos, linking us mm -hmm. to sites on maps they think we should look at. So uh, there, there is that growing community out there and people that do want to be involved. And uh, we appreciate all, all that uh, input. Uh, I guess we apologize, though, that we don't have a system set up to respond to everybody because there is a <laughs> lot of it. And uh, yeah. we're working on that, and that's coming together. And uh, yeah, don't stop sending it in because we 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 need this community to to keep growing, learn yeah, these we're, things, and figure it all out. Yeah, we're not ignoring anybody or neglecting it. Just that you know we're all kind of a bit new at this, and the response has been 
pretty overwhelming. So we're yeah. trying to, um, you know, pull it all together and come up with some kind of a coherent response. What about the Scablands? You guys want to say anything about that? We saw the second week. People should be signing up. I think there's a few openings left. I, I yep. we'd have to talk to Darren up there at Grimerica. He's been handling that, but I think there's some left. And next week we should do a little a little uh, introduction to wh- where we would be going, what we'd be doing, where we would be staying, um, so that the people, you know, if, if somebody's thinking about it but they haven't made up their minds yet, they can might know a little more specifically. Uh, what's on the agenda and okay. what we're going to be doing. So I hopefully by, we're, yeah, go me, ahead. We're about, well, we're about 10 weeks out. So yeah, yeah, we need to get those filled up and uh, start educating the people that, uh, that are going to be out there with us. So they're ready to immerse themselves. Right, right. Because this is going to be, yeah, like Brad just used the term immersion. We're going to immerse people in some of the most spectacular landscapes of catastrophe on planet Earth. Right. And it's not just the trip, but a series of conferences online yes. leading up to the trip up that to are that, going yes. to be looking in detail at the areas that we're going to be visiting with Randall, basically doing slideshows very much just like this show right. um, and, and except talking that, to everybody. Yeah. Except that all the attendees can connect with us. And, right. and it, yeah. it'd be like almost if we're going to take a trip to somewhere, let's say we're going to go to France. So we're going to spend a month or two learning to speak French before we go. Only at this time we're going to learning the language of catastrophist geology mm, and, and right. paleo hydrology so that we can get out in the field and, you know, we can be talking about things and people understand the lingo and understand the concept and have a framework for understanding what they're looking at. And the more prep we do, I think the more intense the experience will be once we're actually out in the field Absolutely. and it'll, it'll build a sense awesome. of anticipation. I mean, how many times do you look at a, at a image of a, of a, say a giant cataract before you finally just get the overwhelming compulsion to want to see it firsthand? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I know that's how it was with me and Brad. <laughs> we did that first trip in 98 boy, leading up to that. We were like, Oh, I want to get out there. And, and of course, <laughs> What I was imagining, and then you get out there, I was not disappointed at all oh, yeah. by what I saw in the field. So, And, and of course, I'll, I'll finally add this one more thing. The scab lands are a very prominent, in-your-face example of catastrophic landscapes. But what you see there, once you go there and once you've seen it, now you have the eyes to, to understand these kinds of features you can begin to see these things in other landscapes, maybe where they're not as dramatically or prominently displayed, but nonetheless, you look at a stratigraphic outcrop or a particular type of deposit or a or or or, or, or a, a, a you know a, a a delta or any number of things. You're looking walking along a, a stream and you notice something that you hadn't noticed before, and now you're saying, "Okay, I see that now. I I, I see um, this is on a smaller scale, but there it is." Yep. So. All right. Thanks to everybody who watches. Thanks to all the supporters out there. All the links for everything we've been talking about are in the show notes. So check those out. If you're interested in emailing us or going on the trips or anything like that, there's also uh, links to scientific papers regarding the Younger Dryas. Uh, And uh, I think that's about it. That was an excellent show, gentlemen. Looking forward to next week. Me too. And hopefully by next week or the week after um, the new Randall Carlson, uh, Website is up, and our uh, our collaboration with HowTube, which is going to be really exciting. Um, yeah. So we'll be talking more about that. Yeah, I, I think oh, yeah. we've been saying that the website's going to be up next week for like four weeks. So hopefully, but we it's can do it it's, this it's, time. <laughs> right. It's not just sitting there stagnant. It, it, no, the longer right. it's taking, the it's more awesome on. it's going to be when it finally goes up. And that's right. <laughs> all of us have been working hard to create the material and the content. Uh, that's ultimately going to end up there. So that's That's right. right. All right. Good night, everybody. everybody. Thanks, guys. Good Good night. Good night.